This is Tom. Tom and I were teammates in college. I haven't had it in years. So Tom's from Long Island, New York, and I teased him when he first came in because he had such a thick accent. So when I was a sophomore, Tom was a freshman. He came in as a, a pretty highly recruited kid. I think he had a bigger scholarship than most, and he was like this guy from New York who was gonna take over the catching position because we had an older, older senior who just was kind of on his way out. And so he and I ended up working together a ton. We were battery mates. I was a starting pitcher from my sophomore year on, and he was the guy behind the plate. So we always had that working relationship and we developed this rapport um, you know, that pitchers and catchers do. Honestly, the funniest thing is I always tell people when I went to UMBC, like we had like, remember Sakaris from Miami? Yeah. And like people just kind of from all over. So I was always very conscious of how people spoke to me. And I felt like over the years, I kind of like adapted to how everybody spoke to me and I just lost You're my standard accent. standard Yankee now? <laughs> my parents still have it and they say coffee and all that stuff, but I don't, I don't do that. I'm told though when I get angry and you know, start getting out. heated, that's when it comes out. It's, it's funny how we've evolved over the years because having not seen each other for five years after college, was it five? Probably five or six. It was actually six full years we hadn't heard a peep out of each other until one night we randomly sat down next to each other in a Long Island bar. But Tom was actually with me in a really pivotal moment in my life. On May 22nd, 2008, we were together playing for UMBC against Stony Brook in the conference tournament in the opening game. I was pitching against Tom Kohler who went on to play a number of seasons in the major leagues. There were a lot of scouts in the stands and it was a really big moment for all of us, all of us at UMBC. And that was the night in the sixth inning with two outs uh, that I blew out my elbow. That was the last pitch I ever threw in college. And with two outs in the sixth, I called him out to the mound and uh, I knew something was wrong. I just wanted to know from him if he could see it or if it was just me, if anyone else knew in the stands that maybe Dan was hurt. So you lived here how long? I lived in Philly for probably a little over a year and then um, bought a house out in the suburbs and moved out there. How long you had the Ray-Bans? These, thank God, I've had them for probably about a year and a half. <laughs> I usually lose everything. So when I was out there, you were catching me, we were in the conference tournament. Did you know something was wrong in the sixth inning? It's tough to explain, but I felt like I could just sense something was up. Didn't I come out to the mound and... I, I like, I think I ushered you out yeah. there. You know, maybe honestly until I went out to the mound where somebody started to question like, you know, what's up? Yeah, why are they talking right now? Because it was like... Well, you're kind of cruising along. Like, it wasn't yeah, the, clean, the, the cleanest game. I mean, I gave four. Well, I guess those last two came in after that, but... We were like moving along. It was like a clean, close game between yeah. both teams. Like we were hitting well, we were playing defense well. Like it was like maybe three two at that point. And then I couldn't get out of that inning. I let two score, and that's where we fell behind. Yeah. But like once I told you, because I told you when you came out, like what happened, right? And then yeah. we were just kind of like, well, <laughs> we're, I think we're, I said let's try and get through the inning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when in hindsight, it's you know that's me in the moment, not necessarily thinking it's. Well, I wasn't going to come term. off that mound. I mean, there were like a bunch of scouts in the stands. Yeah. Like there were a lot watching Tom Kohler, but. And just that game itself. I mean, there was there was a really big crowd. It was a, a night game, really competitive, uh, a lot at, at stake. So it was just almost fitting, not for you, for your sake at least, but you know, it's the story of what happened. What was like the biggest game of like UMBC's career at that right. point? Like our. Yeah. It's not like it was just it was like this random Tuesday tournament. night game. Yeah. It's, you know, something big. Well, and it just was a situation where, like, if I was going to get drafted that year, like, that was the day that it would happen. Right. Like, there were other scouts. There were so many scouts there watching Tom, and that's just how it happens. You just get, like, taken along. Like, they're out watching somebody else. You're there. You do well. Like, they see everybody on the field, right? And 
I think we were all kind of feeling that same thing. And uh, it, was just a, it was just, I had that flashball moment because your buddy hit a dinger off me from Stony Brook earlier in the game. And, but like there's that like really black night sky off yep. beyond first base. And I just remember throwing that pitch and then another pitch and just like looking over there and not knowing like what was gonna come with the rest of that inning. And I just battled and battled and I just couldn't get out of it. And yeah. That was a turning point for you and kind of everything, right? And that was the last college pitch I threw. And started your next turn. I didn't know, yeah, I didn't know it at the time. And I think Tom said it exactly right. That was a turning point because that was the last pitch I threw in my college career. And after that, I was gonna get spit out into the real world and not have a place to play, not have a place to rehab. And uh, it, was, it was a big, big moment that day that he and I were out there on the mound in Farmingdale, New York, uh, trying to get through the sixth inning. So after college, Tom and I went our separate ways. Uh, you know, we were teammates, we were friends, uh, but we weren't like super close where we were gonna call each other. You know, like in Division One baseball especially, guys are flown in from all over the country. So once your time ends, you kind of go back to from where you came, and that's, that's it a lot of times. A lot of times, guys that even that you're relatively close with, you just might not cross paths with again. You just might not hear from each other very much. It's just kind of the way it is. I think everyone keeps their closest friends, but everyone else who's not in that really super tight-knit circle, you just kind of end up going your separate ways. But the weird thing was how Tom and I ran into each other six years later uh, randomly in his neck of the woods. I was with Camden and I was playing. It's like my fifth, my fifth season. We were in Long Island on the road, and I only know maybe like two human beings who live in the state or the not the state, the, uh, the on, on Long Island. <laughs> and my buddy and I, we go out to the bar after the game, and I sit down, and I look to my right, and there's Tom. <laughs> And it was just like a mind-blowing coincidence just to literally look to the right and see a teammate that I hadn't seen in six years. And, uh, but it was cool because what happened from that was we had grown up a lot. Like he had been doing his thing. He'd been getting into real estate. He'd gotten married and I'd still been playing, but we both just grown up so much and we just got to talking. He came out to a couple games later that summer. As it turned out, he moved to Philly where I was playing because I was playing for Camden. And uh, that was just where our like adult friendship kind of took off. And since then we've talked about business, we've talked about lots of different stuff, realizing that we both grew up over those six years in a lot of really similar ways. For me in real estate, at least, I'm very data driven and that's kind of where I get my numbers. It's so trendy to be data driven these days. <laughs> <laughs> um, whereas a lot of people, you know, my colleagues, they, they kind of go based on gut feeling a lot of times and not that there's anything wrong with that. They've, they've made really big, you know, created big businesses from that. Um, but for me, I, I kind of almost wear it as a chip on my shoulder that the fact that I'm numbers and data driven is a reason for a lot of the success that I've had. It took a little while, but I figured it out and it kind of clicked and that's a couple of years in now, I'm really starting to make the impact that I wanted to right off the bat. So, yeah. and the funny thing with, with sticking it out in real estate because there's a huge failure rate in real estate yeah people. it's like 90 percent don't make it yeah it was tough at first and you constantly said you know maybe this isn't right for me i think we're good here um and a few years later now i'm making finally making an income that is more of a career and not just like a job yeah. where i'm making some money yeah and when tom and i talk about success and some of the things that have helped us get where we are now we, we can never have a conversation without Joe coming up. Joe was a grad assistant. He uh, played a couple years of minor league baseball and then joined our staff. And he, I think probably more than anyone, taught us what it was like to be a pro and gave us the insights to one day take it to another level. So Joe was this guy who just sort of like snuck into our life and then really made a huge impact kind of behind the scenes. Behind the scenes was an understatement. So we did not like the pitch calling from our assistant coach who called all the pitches. 
Our coach only wanted to throw away. And I started to figure out like pitching inside for me was a strength. So between Tom and myself and Joe, we had secret signs where Tom would look in for the sign. And if Joe had the pen in his mouth, that meant inside fastball. So we sort of had like these override signs, uh, again, very behind the scenes to override our you know, head and assistant coach's pitch calling. The biggest thing I'll always take from Joe, as crazy as the guy may be, I love him. You know, I, he gave me the, the tools essentially to be like, self-correct myself, you know? If, if, I mean, that's I everything at the higher level. levels because no one even tries to, to change you. Nobody tries to change you and, you know, the older you get, like, people don't want to do that. As I progressed, into different levels like you know when I got to UMBC as a freshman I was not a division one player like you know you were much more of a division one player than I was and everyone has to like pull themselves up to that level just like scaling a wall like, you have to get up there first and then physically pull yourself to that level but you have to know some of these things are available to you and, like the tools that you need to do that because a lot of times you just don't know what it, you've like literally no idea what it takes and then someone shows you no you can do this you can do these things here's how you lift weights here's how you practice like here's how you hit off a tee and here's what you can deduce here's what you can pick up from a hitter if you really watch him and when you start to get that it's like okay i just got like an, it's like you picked up a new weapon in a video game and now you can like beat that level faster and he was a guy who definitely i think for both of us really uh just like gave us those extra tools and those weapons that we could then apply like on the field. And he probably didn't even realize that he was doing that for us. Mm -hmm. I don't think we did either. Like it was just like yeah. conversational stuff. And it's like, whoa, that's a whole nother aspect of the game that I hadn't thought of that now I can, like I have access to. It's like giving you a new key to like a whole new building. Yeah. And you can go through it and you know, you just knock on all the doors and see what you find. So I like the, the story of Tom and I because, you know, we had shared influences. This guy, Joe, who came into, into our lives towards the end of our careers. And, you know, we were both sort of like trying to blossom as players. And then when we graduated and we kind of went our separate ways, some of the teachings from Joe and some of the things that we learned from all sorts of, of coaches and, and other players, it just helped us sort of, again, find this, this kind of parallel road that we ended up running later on well after college baseball ended so even though tom and i hadn't talked in a long time that really just chance encounter in long island along with a really heavily shared experience with our mentor joe and just uh, the college baseball experience kind of led us into a similar path which you take for granted i think some of the people that are in your life now who maybe you just don't see eye to eye with or maybe you just don't you guys aren't running the same race but in five ten years you might be, and you might be surprised uh, by what you find out if you get a chance to sit down and talk with someone you've, that you used to know that you maybe don't see every day anymore. And if nothing else, Tom was there at one of the most pivotal times in my life. You know, standing on that mound, blowing out my elbow in front of all those scouts and ending my collegiate career was a really big deal for me. And he was part of that memory. And, you know, we always have people like that in these, these pivotal moments in our lives. And uh, it's, it's always interesting just to reflect back on that shared experience and then where we've both gone since then.